Well, first of all, Sid, thank you so much for coming to visit the Fred Hutch today as the uh, director's uh, special seminar speaker. It must be especially gratifying for you to have written Emperor of All Maladies, for which you won the Pulitzer Prize, and to have that occur in a context of these rapid and dramatic changes in the way that we think about cancer. So I'm curious about how you think about the, the most exciting things that are happening in cancer. How has that changed during the course of time from when you first started writing your book? I had made a promise to myself that I would rewrite about two chapters of Emperor um, at the end, um, 15 years after the book was published. So it turns out that 15 years is too long. So we're going to do it now at the 10th year. Are you? Now what's amazing is that in these 10 years, that has happened not just to one field within cancer, but to multiple fields within cancer. Um, the most prominent of this among these being, of course, immunological therapy, widely speaking, uh, including the use of uh, new drugs um, that allow uh, the immune system to recognize cancers, which were previously unrecognizable, um, a, a, the use of uh, immune cell transplantation, uh, CAR T cells uh, to uh, allow, again, uh, immune cells to reject and, and send cancers into, into long-term remissions and cure cancers. But also, I, 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 I must uh, say, cancer prevention, um, a, a completely renewed interest in how we could uh, track cancers earlier. And finally, a, a, a really a host of, of uh, uh, methods uh, to uh, detect cancer. So it's obviously been a very exciting time. It just makes my work harder because I have to now write something about it. <laughs> What's our obligation as physician scientists to communicate to the, the general public? How do we get around this challenge of fake news? Of how do we get around over-promising? Yeah, well, I think uh, I mean, the first thing is that science is not fake news. Um, and I think one of the responsibilities we take up tacitly when we become physician scientists or scientists is to communicate what we understand in its full complexity. When you report and communicate the, an idea in its full complexity, readers rise to the occasion. Mm. In fact, they're they're dying for these ideas. They're among the most exciting things we're doing in our world today. Um, and so it is to communicate the excitement. It is to remind people of the challenges and, and be very cognizant about your own biases as you write. The, I mean, is, the excitement, is, the, is there excitement bias in our field? Absolutely. You know, the, the thing that brings, <laughs> things that brings researchers to their laboratories at 9, nine o'clock at night after you know, a long day at work and then coming back the second time is excitement bias. They want to look at their cells. They want to figure out if the experiment worked or not. But on the other hand, I think as scientists, as researchers, that has to be tempered with the idea that not everything will work out. Many things will fail. And to be able to communicate those as well, the disappointments, the caveats, the problems. And all of it can be done, and people are still interested. They will still remain interested, because as I said, we are grappling with some of the most interesting ideas of our times. You're known for being, um, and I know you personally, uh, as being incredibly creative and innovative and out-of-the-box thinker. How do you think about how we encourage younger people coming into this field to think out of the box? The most creative ideas in your life, at least for me, still happened to me, and I, and I know this, when I was in my 20s and 30s. Those are the most important years, and I think the real challenge is how to keep the spark alive for people in their 20s. Just give them adequate mentorship, adequate support, so that in their 20s, when they hit that really glimmering idea, it comes right out and becomes a new treatment for cancer, a new way to prevent cancer, a new way to think about the human genome, the new way to think about some other disease. We had discussions earlier today about the excitement around how to integrate technology and data science into life sciences. And it's an exciting opportunity for us here in Seattle because of the presence of the Microsofts and the Amazons and the Googles of the world, but how do you think about that? Is that is it overhyped? Is it have we realized the potential? Will we realize potential around big data as it relates to cancer care and treatment? Where was the signal from human genomics that would have pointed out the idea that uh, immunotherapy would work in cancer? Um, 
And there was a signal, it, it was a, it, but it was a tiny signal. There was a signal that, in fact, if you looked very deeply at people who responded or didn't respond to certain kinds of therapies, that immune molecules would be involved in the tumor. But it was a tiny signal, and I, I would argue it may have even been a neglected signal. And it took a different kind of scientist to say, wait a second, that signal's important. I'm going to invest my life's work to figuring out how these cells go into tumors, infiltrate tumors, kill tumors. So this is a challenge to big data people as much as it's a challenge to bench experimentalists to say that this ecosystem will only work if they talk together. Yeah, I think we really need that congruence of investigation. Yeah. So um, my last question is, uh, what are the two new chapters in your book going to be or what would you like for them to be? Um, so I think there's a whole chapter around prevention and early detection. Um, which I think will be important. And then there's going to be a, a chapter around new ways of treating and curing cancer. We've covered some of them. Mm -hmm. And finally, I think a third chapter, which I'll give myself three instead of two, about the cultural impact of all of this, the social human impact of all of this as we move forward. Did we reconceive cancer? How much did we, did we reconceive cancer in the last decade or so? Um, what impact will it have for the future of our populations, our aging, our conceptions of ourselves, and what do we ne do next? When can we expect those? Uh, it's, so 2020 is going to be the 10-year mark for the original publication of Emperor. Okay, good. We'll look forward to that. Thank you so much. My pleasure. I really enjoyed it.